Or should I go all the way down, which would be what? 7 minus x like we did in that last problem with the triangle. Let's check this one first. It's got to be one of these. Let's see. Let's try this. So here's a slice, everyone. It said x equal to 1, right? Does someone see this slice? How far should this slice have to travel? A distance of 3. Everyone agree? Well, let's see. If you plug in a 1, you get 3? You're including the spout? Yep, including the spout. Great question. Why? Including the spout, because the water's got to come out of the spout. We're talking about the distance that that slice has to come out in terms of the water. It'll get up to here, and then it's got to go that extra meter to come out of it. And then when we're done, you, if you want, we can remove the spout and see what the answer will look like. So really good question. Everyone, he's like, is this you term at, from that spout right there? Absolutely. So if I had a slice of water right there at x equal to 1, we're saying it would have to travel a distance of 3, right? Does that work when you plug in a 1 here? It's 4 minus 1, 3. Cool. Looks like it's working, but let's double check. Let's make sure it works down here, too. Let's take a slice right here at x equal to negative. Now, use logic or count it up. How far does that slice have to travel to get up out of that spell? Six. Does that one agree? One, two, three, four, five, six. So let's see. Plug in what number? It is four minus negative two, six meters. You got it. So it's not the 7 minus x. So in this case, I had to think 4 minus, wherever I had this, you know, in terms of the distance from the sun. And now it's ready. Set the interval. Here comes the work. We've got 9,800. Oh, I'll put all the constants in front. 9,800. We've got a pi. That's it for the constants, huh? All right, integral symbol. Hey, what is the square root of 9 minus x squared squared? I love it. Just lift that radical off. Might as well write it like that. Uh, you got the 4 minus x. What's this be doing? Delta x becomes dx, right? And now be careful with this. This is where the water is. So where's the water? It's all in here. It's all in here. So I'm going to set up my integral from negative 3 to what? This one, everyone, we'd only set up. I don't want to think you got to solve it. I'd be a setup only. The other ones we solved, all the ones we solved earlier, even the one with what? We solved the circular tank yesterday. You can solve those. I need to solve this too, but so what's most important is setting up this properly, true? Hey, I want to change one more thing. Let's remove the spell and see what, it, what, what changes. Because it's not going to change this, is it? That's where you get good. You start playing with this. So when I'm going to take this off, is this like a hole on top of this here? <laughs> yeah, because there's a little hole right here. Right there, and that's where the water's coming out. The water's getting pumped out of that little hole right there. All right, so this is gone. Well, that stays, because the water's still from what? Negative two to three. This stays, all this stays. What's the only thing that's changing? The distance that each slice goes up. Now this changes. What would you make this? Would it be just now 3 minus x? That one agrees. You can check it. Let's see. How come, oh, I have a question. The sure. last problem, you start at the bottom at 0 and then throw it up. Um, why can't we apply that here? It's because of the shape. It's because of the shape that it be in a sphere. And the idea that the sphere gets what? Really small up here, but also gets really small down here. Different from the other one. Where it just kept getting what wider and wider and wider. I love your question. That's why this is the one shape we're going to scale from the center, because the nature of its design, right? We'll find where it was the widest, and we can easily come up with the radius equation right there. And that's why. But hey, to change that, that would just come to a three. Okay, cool. Everyone, great job with work. I know that's not the easiest of sections. That's some some crazy stuff we got there. Remember, at the end of class, I'll still leave time to get questions on any of these problems other books. You need to work on other ones. The ropes, cables, springs, water getting pumped out the top. Hey, uh, in your notes, we're now moving to section 6.5, which is average value of a function. We 
we leave a heavy section, we get to a really light section. Average 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 Average
it's like, okay, now just give us the function, we can just plug this stuff in there, right? Cool. Hey, so let's start with a simple example. Not that simple, but something a little bit great. Want to use x squared? Um, you want to start at the origin? Okay. X squared is a parabola, right? Hey, help me out. How far do you want to go out with y from x squared? It's a parabola. Look at all those y values it's taken on. Keeps changing, right? How far do you want to go out? I don't care. Four. Hey, let's go out to four. Now, at x equal to four, this gets pretty high. What, like 16? So, and I'm just curious. This yellow curve had a zero here, it has a 16 there, right? And all these values kept changing as the curve moved between x equals zero and x equals four. I want you to find the function's average value. Pretend like this was temperature or something. Like, what was the average temperature between the zero hour and the four hour? Okay, so I'll set up my problem. If you want to write ABE, you can. Function's average value. I put the integral. X squared dx. By the way, this is the biggest error made on tests. I'm so, so close. What did I forget? <laughs> yeah, don't forget it. Don't forget that 1 over 4, or at least do it at the end. 1 over 4 minus 0, which is 1 4. Somebody probably just do this in your head. What's the integral of x squared? X cubed over 3. One fourth of x cubed over three. We go from zero to four. Yeah. Four cubed. One of the fours cancel. Sixteen thirds. Or I heard someone say five and one third, or five point three repeating. That's the average y value this function took on. Between there, well, it's zero, and then it took out a one somewhere. Hey, I want to introduce another theorem. It's called the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem. If you just want to put MVT, you can. But then when the mean value theorem says, as long as that function is continuous, at some x value between 0 and 4, that function had to take on the average value. This goes for every continuous function. All right? Let's see. I can read it from the textbook. I'll say that again. Mean value theorem. This works for any continuous function. And we'll use this as an example. Somewhere between x equal to 0 and x equal to 4, at some x value, this function here had to take on the what? The function's average value. And that's called the mean value theorem. That would go for any function. Even if it went down and went negative. It came back up. At some location, it has it. And it has to happen at least once. Can it happen more than once? I heard that they go, sure. Think of a sine curve, right? Think of the sine curve. I just want to give you an example. Here you go. Yeah. Yeah. Now when I went up from 0 to 2 pi, I think I'll take it out another slice. Another slice. <laughs> I apologize. I think I'll take this out one more cycle. All right, so I'm going to go up and then back down to 4 pi. Okay. So this is the sine curve. Can everyone see it? Gets up to 1. How low does it get? Negative 1. Negative 1. I went from 0 to 2 pi, did another cycle, out to 4 pi. You all probably can tell, what's the average value that it takes on? 0. Can you see it? A lot of you just see it. You're like, I don't even have to do the math. The average value takes on positives and negatives. And positives and negatives, the average value it's taken on is 0, right? So, mean value theorem says at some x value, that function has to take on that average value. How many times did it do that? Let's see, here it did it, here it did it, here it did it, here it, right? But it has to happen at least once. So, I was curious, this last problem we did, could you tell me the value of x that this function took on the average value? How would you solve it? I'll raise this. My question is, let me say this again, can you determine, you found the function's average value, right? There it is. That's f f. Right here. I'm right over. This is f. Substitute y for 5.3 and then solve for x squared. Yeah, and do I need an integral? No, he says just do some algebra. He says just take f of x, right? Set it, what is it, 5.1? 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5
Three, um, the line of it is just set it equal to the function and solve for x. Don't do any integral, right? But do you agree, like, we're saying, with this case here, Chris, we're saying there's going to be some value of x, somewhere in here, that it just takes on. It actually, the y value equals this. And we're like, go find out at the x value. And they're like, oh, well, what was the function? The function was just x squared. I'll just set it equal to this. I'll use the fraction. What was it? 16 thirds. And we can find out the x value that it actually took on the functions out of value. So that's what it means. So we want to do the slope like before. All we have to do is find that x value where it took on the value. Because if we know it's guaranteed as long as it's a continuous function. We know it's guaranteed, we're just going to solve it. We go, oh, to do that, we don't even have to do calculus. Take the original function, whatever it was, and set it equal to this and solve it, right? Hey, um, if I take the square root of both sides, I get plus or minus, right? What's the square root of 16 over 3? Can I simplify that? Uh, I can make it 4 over what? 4 over the square root of 3. Right? So in what is 4 divided by the square root of 3? I know there's an irrational number. I can leave it like this. And we'll talk about that negative. But I'm just curious. What? 2.309. 2.3? 2.3? And when 4 divided by 1.7 is about 2.3. So just in our image, this is x equal to 2. So somewhere around what? Right around there, it took on the average value. Let me just write it right here. You want to put this in a picture. The f ab was 5.3 repeating, but it occurred right here at x equal to 4 over root 3, which is roughly 2 point, what was it? 309. 3. Just to give you an idea. I'll take out the negative because we only went from 0 to 4, right? Cool. So great questions. But that's all we do if you had to find a value. We know it has to happen at least once, true? And with a, something like a sine curve, it can happen over and over and over over an interval. Uh, is this something to expect like a problem? Like once you solve for the MVT, you say, can you tell part me what a part B or what time it took the um, average? The book does that. So when you hear his question, it was a good question. He goes, should I expect this? The book loves to do that. So I'm going to section 6.5. And what to do is, They'll have a, this is like problems like number nine. I'll wait till you get there. Look on page 453. And what they'll do is they'll do a two-part question, or in this case, they did a what? Three-part. What they want you to do in letter C? Tell the class on number nine. Sketch the what? Sketch the graph. Which we did. I think it's good to sketch a graph just to get an idea of the image. Yeah. So everyone, in this case, what you'll do is you'll find the average value. And then letter B, find that value such that it equals that. Cool? So, yes, good question, but expect it, and you'll see it in the homework problems. But also, look at numbers 1 through 7. Numbers 1 through 7, they just ask for what? The average value? So sometimes they don't. So be able to read the directions in the book and follow the directions. Cool. Can I raise? So in this problem, everyone, I just want you to find the average value. All right, let's find average value. That's the max. Equals 4x square root x squared plus 4 and when on the interval, zero to four. So we're going to find the average value of that function on the interval zero to four. But we won't do a part B on this problem.
Hey, uh, one slight change, I apologize. Make this 2x squared plus 4. Again, I apologize. Everyone inside the radical, let's use 2x squared plus 4. So the function is 4x times square root of 2x squared plus 4. The interval is 0 to 4, x equals 0, x equals 4. We're going to find the functions out. Set it up. What's the limits? Ooh. Just put the function down, right? You're the best, thank you. I got the reminder. She said, don't forget to put the 1 over 4 minus 0, which she knows is just a 1. A 4. I put 1 over 4 minus 0 in case they ask you to go from 1 to 4. Because then you do 1 over 4 minus 1, right? Well, this isn't bad. I mean, that's just one fourth. I think the only challenge. How do you think? I'm hearing it. You sub. Great class. I heard it pretty loud. You sub. We need to do a you sub here. This is the substitution rule. So look for where the power is higher by one. It's under that radical. There you go. Can we go off to the side? Let's let u equal. 2x squared plus 4. What's du? What am I doing the third step? Anybody just need a review on u sub, the substitution rule? My first step, we let u equal to some portion in that integral. I differentiate both sides with respect to x. And then the third step, many times I'll divide that constant out. But a lot of you may look over here and say, wait a minute, can I stop at step two? I can replace that entire x, dx, and the what? The four with the du. So I do want to point out that that was like a, a seven or something, then I would have gone one more step and divided the four. Right? And we said one fourth du equals that. That's what I need to say. But I'm going to do it right now. This and this is getting replaced with a du. All this is getting replaced by the letter u. And so this gets a lot, lot better. Just the one fourth integral square root u. D. How about that? Now, show of hands, who likes to change these limits? You can wait till the end. So and there's a few hands up, so I want to do that. Just because there are a few, few students here, they like to change the limits of integration. Rather than wait until the end and replace them, put an x back. And so I'm going to change them. I need this then. So when that had a 0, what is 2 times 0 squared plus 4? So this is really a 4 now. What is 2 times 4 squared plus 4? Keep in mind, not everyone does this. Some just don't put anything here. Do the whole integral, replace everything with x. OK. What's the integral of square to u? How do you integrate that? Is that u to the 1 half? You pump up 1 half by 1, what do you get? U to the 3 half. And then you divide 3 halves, multiply 2 thirds. Come to agree? Now, what else number do I have? Don't forget about that 1 fourth. I've got a 1 fourth times a 2 thirds, u to the 3 halves. And I'm just going to go from a 4 to a 36. You want to put parentheses around this again? Or, see, some students do not change their limits. They put it back as u, and then just remember in the end to replace u with what? What was u? 2x squared plus 4. And what were the x values? 0. So it's your choice of how you want to, in that last step, evaluate these integrals when you're using the substitution rule. Right? 
It's up to you how you want to do it. You like doing this? Great, just don't forget to change these. What do you just say? I'll never change the limits, I'll just remember to always replace them. Well, I'll do it both ways, you should get the same answer. What is one fourth or two thirds? One sixth? And I get 36 to 3 halves minus 4 to 3 halves. Or, what do you get here? One sixth of, I put a 4 in here. 2 times 4 squared, 16 plus. 32 times plus 4 is 36 to the 3 halves. Subtraction, I put a 0 in there. 0 plus 4 is? Can we simplify these? Does everyone know how to simplify these? They're not that bad. That means the square root of 36, and then you got to cube it. That means the square root of 4, and then you have to cube it. And these are rational numbers. Sure, if it said the square root of 13, that's going to be irrational, but isn't the square root of 36 perfect? So what's the square root of 36? Now you get a cube of 6. 216. 216. So I get 1 sixth of 216. Let's try this number. What's the square root of 4? What's 2 cubed? 8. This will be our answer. This is the average value of the function. Same thing would happen here. I just wanted to present it both ways because I don't know which way you can do it. Let's do 16 minus 8. So the answer is 2 of 8 all over 6. Or 1 3. Or that's it. You raise the decimal if you want. Job and that's the functions out of value. Hey, any questions on this side? That was way lighter than the, uh, the section 6.4. Substitution rule, this is another integration technique. All right? If you're wondering, that's you saw we were doing. The integration using the substitution rule is like the reverse of chain rule. Remember chain rule with derivatives? Okay. Well, now we've got to think of what's the reverse for the product rule. So can you help me generate the formula? There's a formula for this for doing the integration by parts. Integration by parts. But I was wondering if you could help me invent the actual formula that we will use every time in this course we want to do integration by parts. And be sure that you're going to be able to recognize when should I do integration by parts versus the substitution rule. Well, to start out, everyone, I'm going to put the product rule f of x times g of x, because it is reversal of that. It's going to help me generate the formula for integration by parts. So let's start with the derivative of f of x times g of x. So go back to calc 1. What is it? Is it just f prime times g prime? 
No, you got to do product, but what was it? F prime G plus G prime X. All right, F prime of X, right? Or you can do F, it doesn't matter the order, right? You can do first times the root of the second, F times G prime of X plus G prime of X times Okay. No, you right. have to do the same thing twice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. F times G plus G times F prime. Thank you very much. That did it on purpose, though. So, we, hey, first time through the second plus the second time through the first, true? Nice. First time through the second plus second time through the first. Now, we want to make a formula for doing integration by parts, so I need you to integrate both sides. Let's take an integral of this. Put an integral on this one. <coughs> and because I'm putting an integral on this, I'll put little dx's. Yeah. Integral on this. Now tell me about this. I mean, what if I do the integral of the derivative? What happens to this? Cancels. Yes, it just cancels out. So I just have whatever here. We have f of x times g of x, but I still have these whatever here. E f of x, g prime of x. Plus the g of x times f prime of x. Thank you, we are actually right now deriving the formula for integration by parts. We're a step away, okay? What I need you to do is just subtract this right here from both sides of the equation. See this right here? Just subtract that from both sides of the equation. What would I have? Here it is. F of x, g of x. Subtract integral f of x. So this would be, in this case, actually, you know what I'm going to subtract? I'll subtract that one right there. Don't worry, everyone. I didn't want you to think this may be a little bit crazy to memorize this one. So we'll come up with an easier way to memorize this. All right, there we go. Well, this is the formula that we'll use to use to perform integration by parts. Right there. But uh, f, g, and g, and f prime, everyone, maybe it's easier if we just call, let f of x be u. And let g of x be v. And using the letters u and v, it's an easier way to remember this formula here. Although you can always derive 